Uh, we're going to just dive right in where we left off a couple weeks back in Matthew chapter 5 and this series on the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. And so if you've got your Bibles open there, uh, just for sake of time, what we'll do this afternoon is we'll read Matthew chapter 5, uh, 1 through 5, and we'll stop there because that's the one we're dealing with today, what's in verse 5. All right, so I trust you found your, your spot in the Scriptures, and you can follow along as I read out loud. The Bible here says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right in uh, to what the Lord has for us. Father, thank you once again for uh, the joys of being part of this church family. Uh, Thank you that this is a group of believers that Uh, Lord, we can come together Sunday by Sunday, and we can worship and serve you together and sing together. As uh, Pastor explained uh, wonderfully from the text uh, this morning there in Colossians. And Lord, I pray that we just have that unified spirit and that, that heart of praise and worship unashamed to glorify you, and even to sing to you, Lord. Um, Thank you for what we have already received today. Thank you for the fellowship over this past uh, few moments, over over the refreshments, over the lunch. And I pray now that you just, um, Lord, open our hearts to receive what you have for uh, us yet before we go on our separate ways. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness, lowliness, humility, that's not a trait that we come by naturally in our human flesh, in our fallen sinful condition. You know, it's contrary to the way most people live. How many of you have heard of the world heavyweight champion back in the day. Uh, he was, it was first Cassius Clay, then it was Muhammad Ali. Familiar with that name? And he was very, um, uh, came across uh, braggadocious, you know, very bold and so forth. And the story's told that Muhammad Ali was at, at the airport and he boarded his plane to take his flight. And the flight attendant came by reminding the passengers to fasten their seatbelts. To which Muhammad Ali responded and said, Superman don't need no (laughs) seatbelt. And the stewardess kindly reminded him. Well, she said, sir, Superman don't need no airplane. (laughs) At which point he fastened his seatbelt. Uh, We we don't uh, come by this business of meekness easily. And it's because as we look at these Beatitudes, we've seen the poor in spirit, we've seen the mourner. Now we're going to look at at meekness today, the meek. It's, It's because God's ways are not man's ways. In fact, if you look at these verses from Isaiah 55, where the Bible says, Uh, And this is God speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. And so God's ways are contrary to the way we, we would naturally think. God's thoughts are contrary to to Jewish thinking of of that day. You know, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, was written to the Jew for a Jewish audience. And they all thought the Messiah had to come as a conquering king. 
not as a suffering lamb. God's ways are contrary to, to common practice, not only of Jesus' day, but of our day. You know, so many times we fall into this delusion that victory and success comes through large bank deposits, big buildings, dominant personalities. I'm in it to win it kind of a mentality. God's way is contrary to liberal thought. You know, that idea that we've got to have unity at all costs. Put everything aside, including even truth and morality, uh, just to get along together. God's ways are set forth here in this wonderful passage. And we've talked about the idea that here the, the characteristics are set forth uh, that really represent a completed citizen of the kingdom. What a complete Christian life looks, looks like. So there's seven attributes essentially that we're talking about that are all suggestive of, first of all, a, a present partial reality, but they lead us to a future perfect reality. And when you look at lists like these in the Scripture, you know, another one that comes to mind is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. It's a ninefold fruit of the Spirit. The, these are not spiritual smorgasbords. It's not the Mandarin. You know, you don't get to go up to the counter and pick and choose. Well, you know, I kind of like that, um, uh, th that part of it, but, uh, but I, don't, I, I don't like the poor in spirit. I don't like the mourning. You know, I just I leave that to the side like the vegetables. No, it, it all comes together. It's all part of one package. And even in the Beatitudes, uh, it's somewhat progressive as we work through. You know, Jesus starts with being poor in spirit. And mourning, you know, unless we're broken, God can't take us to where we need to go next. And then we come to this thing of this this thing of meekness. What 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 does meekness mean? How would we define that? Uh, well, you know, it starts again, as I said, with being poor in spirit, being a mourner. Uh, but one thing that we need to do is dispel a popular misconception when we talk about meekness. And that is that meekness is weakness. Meekness, folks, is not weakness. You know, <laughs> a, a man is not meek, a woman is not meek because he cannot help himself. For instance, the Lord Jesus was meek. He exhibited meekness, but he had at his fingertips in the infinite resources of God. And so, meekness is not weakness, but could we say it's this? Power under control. Power under control. In fact, the Greek word translated meekness was used to describe three things. Number one, a soothing medicine. Now think about this. Medicine can be taken into the body to heal, but an overdose can kill you. Power under control. Are you getting the idea? Another uh, way that th this uh, word was uh, used to describe was that of a gentle breeze. So... <laughs> We have a, a son and daughter-in-law living in Las Vegas. And we've been through there in July when it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Now, you know how when, it, when it's warm here in the summer and you get that, that gentle breeze, you get a, a wind blowing in, and you're like, boy, that's refreshing, and that's awesome. There's no such thing as a refreshing breeze at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It intensifies the heat. I mean, it's like walking into a blast furnace. It, it's just bad. Um, so a gentle breeze is refreshing. But, you know, wind can also be destructive. We all know about hurricanes and tornadoes too, right? 
So this is the idea, power under control. The third description here is that of a broken colt. Uh, a, bro- a, a horse that's, that's broken can become a productive and useful uh, beast of burden. But a wild horse can be a very dangerous animal to be around. So meekness, power, power under control. It's not about being a doormat. Okay, Someone actually coined an acronym for doormats as dependent organization of really meek and timid souls. <laughs> um, that's the wrong idea. The Bible here is speaking about really what is a powerful virtue. Can we live a life like that, a life of power under control? Understanding, yes, without God, I am nothing. Without Him, we can do nothing. Yes. But, in Christ, we can also do all things. Understanding that the power is in the Lord. So, the meek person has simply surrendered all his rights and demands to Christ, and the power flowing through his or her life is dependent upon the Lord. And therefore, in meekness, we refuse to exalt ourselves. It's neither self-assertiveness, self-interest, or self-deprivation. It is not elevated or cast down. The truth about meekness is it's not occupied with self at all. Uh, M.R. DeHaan, I don't know if, how many of you know that name, but um, he was kind of the founder of the whole organization. They did the daily breads and so forth. He was a powerful fundamental preacher back in the 40s, 1940s and 50s. But he used to say, humility is something we should constantly pray for, yet never thank God that we have. Okay, because the moment you think you've achieved that, you've lost it. Okay, it's, it's something that God is working in, in our lives. So, meekness defined, power under control, my rights surrendered to him. Okay? Meekness manifested. Let's talk about that. Again, meekness is an attitude. These are be attitudes after all. But... Like any other attitude, meekness is always demonstrated through our actions. You know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not how we proclaim ourselves to be meek. It's what the Lord knows us to be. And it's what our testimony before others, in fact, actually is. Okay? And if you're, if you're a meek person, if you have the meekness of Christ dwelling in you, You don't need to proclaim that to anyone. You don't need to take on an air of a false humility. You just be you, and others will see that. (laughs) But how, how is it manifested? How is this really inworked grace of the soul manifested through our lives? First and foremost, it has to be manifested toward God toward God. It's it's that attitude and that spirit in which we accept His dealings with us as good in all things without disputing, without resisting. Our spirit is not fighting against God and what He's doing in our lives. You know, it's Abraham praying because his brother, Lot, was there in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. His nephew, pardon me, not his brother, his nephew. And God had declared that he was going to destroy the wicked city. And Abraham interceded with God. You know, will you spare it for 50 
How about for 40? And he whittled that right down. He kept praying uh, until he asked if God would spare it for the sake of 10. And God said that he would. But as Abraham wrestled with God over that and prayed with God, he made this declarative statement. He said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham was imploring God. He was interceding for his nephew. He was interceding for that wicked city. And yet at this, in the same breath, he said, God, I know you're going to do right. I know you're going to do the right thing. That's the spirit of meekness. And we enter into that same spirit every time that we have a receptive heart towards the word of God. I don't have all the verses on the screen. There were, there were so many verses I've got here. So you're actually going to have to look a few up. I hope you're okay with that. You brought your Bible? Amen? Maybe it'll help keep some of us awake. <laughs> James 1.21. Can someone look that up? And, and uh, whoever gets that first, you're welcome to just read that out loud for us. James 1.21. Isn't that great? How are we to receive the Word of God? According to James 1.21. Receive it with meekness. A spirit that says, I'm, I refuse to exercise my own rights. I will humbly receive God's Word for what it says. And that's able to save our souls. Not only in terms of deliverance from the, the penalty of, of sin and the, the judgment of hell, but is also able to deliver us out of all kinds of horrific situations this side of heaven. Amen? Receive it with meekness. We also in our exercise or the manifestation of our meekness towards God, we will live wisely and obediently. James 3.13. Someone else read that for us. Uh, 3.13. Thanks, Dan. Okay, there you, there you are. So, you know, we, we want to be wise men and women? Who, who is that wise man? Who, who is that wise woman? Who is that person that's endued with knowledge among you? And then here it is. Let them show out of a good conversation. That's our behavior. His works with what? Meekness of wisdom. So toward God... And then by extension toward others. And, you know, this meekness is going to reveal itself in our human relationships. It's, it's going to reveal ourselves to be either right or wrong with God. It reveals itself many times even when we're in a position of strength. And we might be, you know what, we, we, might, we might be holding... The right position. Bless God. I got the truth nailed down. But you know, holding the right position does not justify a wrong disposition. Even when we know ourselves to be right. Why, why do we always have to be in it to win it? Why do we have to win the argument? Why do we have to exert ourselves? Well, it's because we're not in a right standing with God. I don't know how else to say that, but it's true. We could easily hold a right position and hurt other people. 
and frustrate what the Lord wants to do in their lives. So we, we need to have the spirit of meekness toward all men, Titus 3 and verse 2. I'll just read some of these next verses quickly. Titus 3, 2 says, Speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle. And, and thus describing some of the, the qualities of a bishop here, a pastor. Showing all meekness unto all men. Not only all men generally, but specifically towards erring brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 1. Beautiful verse. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, you know, don't, don't raise your hand, but, but, but how many of you would want to be considered spiritual? I, I think we would. We want to be look, looked at with that regard and respect. Okay, so what it, it, is it here? Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider in thyself, lest thou also be tempted. God gives you an opportunity to influence and impact a brother or sister who's fallen, who's been hurt, who's given in maybe to a life-dominating sin, any situation. Your role is to come along with a spirit of restoration and in meekness, understanding you are not one iota better than the person you're reaching to help. Okay? This, this is not, if, if I could draw it on a blackboard, <laughs> you know, th this, this is not the counselor, you know, reaching down from, from heavenly heights and saying to the one who's fallen, hey, buddy, you know, listen to me. God and I are going to straighten you out. No, this is, this is the counselor coming alongside of the hurting, fallen individual and saying, brother, sister, I'm not any better than you. And in fact, I need help just like you do. But if you'll allow me to, we can go to God together and find the help that you need. That's the spirit of it. That's the spirit of it. The word restore actually speaks of, you know, the idea of setting a broken bone. Uh, you know, years ago, I, I like, like pastor, I grew up skiing. I enjoyed skiing. Uh, but the first time down the slope, I, I broke my leg. You know, it was rather, I won't get into all the details, it was rather a stupid thing, but I ended up breaking my leg. And you know what? I'm so glad that the, the medics on the slope and the other uh, group, the teenagers we were with, nobody condemned me. Nobody was yelling at me, hey, Brian, what a stupid idiot you were. What do you, what do, you do that for? You know, way to go and ruin our skiing trip and all that. I got more love and concern and attention than I've ever gotten in my life. I'm like, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you don't criticize someone when they're down and they're broken. You get them to the doctor. You get them the help that they need. You try and make them uh, as, as warm and comfortable and, and insulate them from further injury. Isn't that right? And that's true spiritually. All right? So restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You know, even not, not only just un, uh, with, with erring brothers and sisters in Christ, but even with the unsaved. We ought to have a meek spirit toward unsaved people. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words, erect an altar in your hearts to worship the Lord. Just like pastors been preaching this year. Really, it, it all comes back to this. It comes back to worshiping God. So sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and then be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you 
with meekness and fear. I love the story of Robert and Mary Moffat, pioneer missionaries to Africa. If you ever get a chance to pick up that biography, it is incredible what they experienced there. Being missionaries on foreign soil without all the modern conveniences that we enjoy today. We're talking the mid-1800s. And Mary Moffat wrote a letter to her son describing their missionary service in Africa in light of the Savior's sacrifice for them. You know, Robert and Mary Moffat had many invitations when they went back to England to speak in prominent churches and go prominent places and be recognized. Mary Moffat did not want any of that. In this letter to her son, she said, We, we are but worms doing what we can for fellow worms. Think about that. You know, just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's what we are in this world to, to, to lost people. And therefore, in, in the face of even those that would do us wrong, we ought to have the sense that their insults and injuries that can be inflicted are actually permitted and sometimes even employed by God for the use of purifying us, making us better, allowing us to be more like Jesus. So, therefore, we are to seek meekness. Zephaniah 2.3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be that ye may be hid in the days of the Lord's anger. We're to seek it, we're to put it on. Colossians 3.12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And we are uh, literally to be adorned with it. Meekness ought to be our clothing. 1 Peter 3, 4. It says, let it be the hidden man of the heart in, which, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, I know Peter's writing uh, to the women in this context. But if there's a characteristic like that, a quality, a spiritual quality, a spiritual grace, it's good for a woman, it's good for a man. Meekness. Be clothed in it. Put it on. Seek it out. In fact, we referred to the fruit of the Spirit earlier. Isn't meekness a component in that ninefold fruit of the Spirit? Yes, it is. So just to summarize things quickly, we have uh, meekness progressively growing out of the, the poor in spirit, out of the heart of the mourner, a progressive ideal here, each one building upon the foundation of the others, because an individual cannot be meek until he first sees himself in the light of God until he or she first sees themselves and understands uh, that, that uh, platform of brokenness and serious about sin. Then we realize, you know, we've got no rights or privileges that we can independently exercise apart from God. And we are nothing apart from Him, but in Him we can do all things. And His power under control, a mild, gentle attitude which accepts God's dealings as good with unquestionable submission. And it's manifested in our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Now, we have a couple minutes left, and this part is kind of maybe a little more of an appendix to the message. Uh, But, okay, we'll get to the characteristics in just a minute. But can you think of some biblical examples of meekness? We'll just make it interactive here. Give me some characters in the Bible that are an example of meekness. Okay, Abraham, absolutely. You know, just even in that, in that intercession uh, before God and how that, you know, God had promised him an heir as well. And don't forget about that. Like, you know, he was an old man. 
by the time that promise came to fruition. And yet Paul tells us in the book of Romans that, that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. And there was just that meekness and humility in his faith. So that's a great example. Anything else? Anyone else? Moses. In fact, doesn't the Bible say that, that Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth? You know, I, I, I would think leading two million plus rebellious people through the desert would probably have something to do with, with instilling that character in a person, right? I, I used to, when, uh, you know, we were raising all six children at home, I remember on Sunday mornings, you know, getting everybody ready and out the door in time for church and you're the pastor, you want to be there first or near first, <laughs> And uh, I, I would say sometimes, you know, I can only imagine what Moses went through trying to get two million people out of Egypt. <laughs> but, yeah, he, he, wa- he was meek. Um, some other examples. Uh, Brother Ron. Job. Yeah, Job was meek. You know, he, in, in all this, you know, he, even when his wife said, you know, why don't you curse God and die? And the Bible says that Job never charged God foolishly. Okay, any other examples? Come to the New Testament. What, what's, what's the ultimate example of meekness? Well, okay, we'll call him the penultimate example. Because the ultimate example is Jesus. But Paul was, a, Paul was a meek man, yes. You know, he was willing to just embrace his suffering. And, um, you know, he, 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 he did it gladly for the cause and the service of Jesus Christ. But come with me to Matthew chapter 11 where Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You know, we stop short of the cross. We stop short of Calvary. We stop short of the example of Jesus so many times. When we're presented an opportunity to live out this quality of meekness. We want to we want to insert ourselves and say, "Well, I got rights here, you know? Like this is my life and this is these are my things and every Wait a minute. Jesus said, "Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart." And ye shall find rest under your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Wow, the meekness of Jesus. Going to Calvary. As a lamb, sheep going to the slaughter. Didn't open his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. That's meekness, power under control. You, you, re, you remember when that entourage of the, the high priests led by, led by none other than the betrayer himself confronted Jesus just outside of Gethsemane? And Jesus said, who are you looking for? And they said, well, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, he spoke three words. He said, I am he. They fell backwards. <laughs> I mean, he just spoke three words. He had all the power of heaven and earth at his command. He could have destroyed them in a heartbeat. This same Jesus, when Peter, who was supposed to be his, his stal, stalwart, you're going to stand by Jesus to the end, he pulled out his sword. That servant of the high priest, Malchus, had his ear sliced off. I think Peter swung for the neck, got his ear. And Jesus, in meekness, he stooped down and he touched that and he healed him. Among the men that were coming to arrest him and take him away to be crucified. Jesus said, learn, learn of me. Learn of me. Don't do it your way. Do it my way. My thoughts are not your thoughts. 
As the heaven is high above the earth, so my ways are above your ways. Learn of me. Wow. Quickly, characteristics of meekness. And then we're through. Just, just a fistful of them here. It's, it's not prideful. Okay? No, no room for pride in, in our Christian lives. The, the meek individual is not interested in being a center of attention. Not interested in putting himself forward. He'd rather promote others and specifically promote the Lord. You know, Philippians 2, I think it's 3 and 4. Yeah, here it is. Let, uh, Jesus, the, Paul wrote, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. You know, it, it's a meek man who, when, when the world is lauding that man, can deflect and direct all that glory back to God. Stories told of a well-known American preacher. He had been invited to, to a conference, and he stood up. As he stood up to deliver his message, he was met with enthusiastic applause. To which he responded, applause before the message is an act of faith. He said, applause in the middle of the message is hope. And applause at the end of the message is charity. <laughs> and basically he was saying, I'm, I'm really nothing to be applauded. You're going you're gonna to learn it, right? That's a humble response not prideful. It's, it's not demanding. We're, we're not demanding things for himself. Don't, we, we don't even take all the things that we could rightfully claim. And again, we go to Jesus for the example, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now that's an interesting statement in verse 6 there. And sometimes it's, it's a little difficult to understand. What's this idea of not, not being robber to be equal with God? Well, the JWs have come along, and they'll totally twist that and say, see, Jesus never claimed to be God. That's not what this is saying. What it's saying is that Jesus did not consider his deity, his rightful standing with his Father as the Son of God, all his rights and privileges as the God of this universe, he did not consider that a thing to be grasped for. He didn't somehow have to jealously hang on to that. He was totally and completely secure in his position and in his deity. But rather than have to grasp for that. You see, maybe an example of this is when Satan took him out into the wilderness to tempt him, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, look, you, you bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all these things. You know, Jesus wasn't grasping for that. Basically, he said, get thee, get thee behind me, Satan. If, if Jesus could lay down, and, and it goes on to say, but he made himself of no reputation. This is what he did. And didn't grasp at that. He rather took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And by laying down our own rights, you know what? We avoid tragedy. We avoid a horrible accident. You know, imagine driving, driving out in the country somewhere. Have you ever seen those little one-lane bridges? Maybe across a little creek or river? Way out in the country, maybe even on a gravel road. And there'll be either, you know, there might be a stop sign or there might be just a little sign that says yield to oncoming traffic. And that yield sign is actually on both sides of the bridge. And it's just a helpful way 
of reminding people that when you yield your right of way, you can avoid a head-on collision. And you know, the Bible commands us to be subject one to another, to yield our own rights. And that's a very reasonable and gracious command and helps us avoid those interper interpersonal head-on collisions. When you insist on your right of way, you could be asking for trouble. But if you lay it down, you lay it down, you will be none the worse for wear, and you also might spare someone else. So it's not, it's not demanding meekness. Neither is it sensitive or defensive. Not easily offended when others talk about us. Our sensitivity to others' comments shows our self-pride and our lack of meekness. Let, let others say whatever they want. You don't answer to them. You can answer to God. Psalm 119, 165, David said, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. It's not sensitive, defensive like that, and finally, it's not retaliatory. Again, the, the spirit of retaliation is not one of meekness. Jesus was a, our example in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, which says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he... When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. And we're to do the exact same thing according to Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You don't have to retaliate. Bless them that persecute you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. You know, love those that hate you. Love your enemies. That's also in the Sermon on the Mount. Wow. What about the rewards of, of meekness? And I, I call it the earthly rewards of meekness. I know it says here, the meek shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We, we know that there's a later fulfillment of that in the sense that there'll be a millennial earthly reign of Jesus Christ here. There's coming a heavenly kingdom. And we're going we're gonna to have a part of that. We're going to have an inheritance in all of that. And so the life to come certainly is in play here. But the meek not only inherit that coming future kingdom, we inherit some really good side benefits here. Like satisfaction. Psalm 22, verse 26. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Like spiritual guidance. Psalm 25, and verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach his way. How about even promotion? Psalm 147. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. <laughs> the Lord will take care of you. He'll, he'll, put, he'll put you in the spot. He'll, he'll pro, he's able to promote you. How about joy? Isaiah 29, 19. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Show me the happiest Christian you can find. And I'll show you someone who's got a meek spirit. Humble, lowly before the Lord. They're not interested in their own rights and privileges. They're really not thinking a whole lot about self at all. But boy, they have a joy that effervesces, that overflows, that's infectious and contagious wonderful.